Hey everybody, how's it going? I hope you're having a really lovely, amazing day. So today I'd like to go over some posts in a Mac Rumors thread that is about my recent video on soldered and SSDs, and it also just so happens to be about me as well. I've had an account on Mac Rumors since 2009. I used to post troubleshooting information to the forum back in the day. There was this one guy, D-A-D-I-O-H, who had an amazing thread about troubleshooting component level motherboard issues. I had asked some of the people at the site if they were open to starting a sub forum where we could just dedicated to troubleshooting motherboard issues, and I never heard back, so I eventually started my own forum, which you could see here, so I don't visit the site as much anymore, but I still lurk from time to time. One of my moderators sent me a thread that's about 10 pages long, that is about soldered and SSDs, and is also about me, so I thought I'd read some of the comments and give you some of my thoughts on it from my perspective. One of the things that I think is really important to go over here is that when you're dealing with somebody that disagrees with you, you're usually not going to get them to go over to your side if you act like a dick, so if you are going to go over to that forum and talk to people, then I think it is really important to not be an asshole. I pointed that out in this video that I did about Amazon and the Ring doorbell a while back that is loading really slow because I am unfortunately cursed with Spectrum Internet, but I would highly suggest that you watch this video before you go over and talk to anybody on any sort of social media platform about the issue of the soldered and SSD. That being said, let's get started. So I'm going to read some of the comments and then read you my commentary. First comment that I thought was interesting, I would actually expect that someone who makes money via repairs would prefer that companies make their systems more repairable, rather than, you know, see that the business is trending down and get into another line of business. Uh, this is a yes and a no. So I personally advocate for systems to be more repairable as a general principle. But systems being more repairable can actually be worse for the profit margins of more advanced repair shops like mine. Because more advanced repair shops make money from doing jobs that conventional repair shops and end users cannot. So I'll give you one example. If you're talking about the A1181 MacBook that came out in 2006, so what you see over here is an inverter board. And the size of this is approximately from my pinky finger to my wrist. It's absolutely gigantic. Now, technically, this is a lot easier to fix than the newer MacBooks that came out around 2011 that used a micro BGA chip that's soldered to the board. This is a micro BGA soldered chip that is about the size of my pinky finger now. It's actually about half the size of my pinky finger now. I would not advocate that computers still be built with this when they could be built with this. Even though this is more repairable, this has parts that you can pull out with your finger now, it's like it's essentially manufactured like a Lego, it's easy to fix, that is not something that I would advocate within the realm of right to repair because technology really does need to move on. You can make devices a lot smaller when you can solder something like this into the board, and more importantly, this chip is actually infinitely more reliable than your old inverter board. The LP8550 fails way less often than an inverter board fails. This was considered at some point a wear part. This is eventually going to wear out, whereas an LP8550, that thing could just keep trucking along until now to the end of time. So this is a repair that could easily be done by the end user that's now going to require some advanced micro soldering skill to do properly. Uh, technically, once that repair became a repair that required micro BGA soldering skills, it meant that 90% of the repair shops back in 2011 that did this type of work were no longer able to do this repair without outsourcing it. At the time, that meant more business for us. I understand that times have to move on, and that having a backlight circuit that is the size of my thumb makes no sense when it can be half the size of my pinky finger now. There are many cases where something being more difficult to repair means more revenue for us as a component level repair shop. An example, an easily user replaceable battery is not something a customer is going to pay me labor to replace, but a gluten battery is something they will pay me to replace. However, I still often advocate for the non-gluten battery. Now, maybe one can say this is advocating against my own self-interest as a business owner with regards to my repair business, but I see it as advocating for my own self-interest as a consumer that wants to live in a repairable world where that trumps the interest of my, my company. Next. Rossman's entire shick is to sell outrage and hyperbole to an undiscerning audience of mostly young men for YouTube engagement. He skirts the line between a YouTube reactionary and a self-help huckster, and it's very successful. I think this person is trying to call me Andrew Tate. And when it comes to self-help, yeah, there's about a few hundred videos on how to fix your own stuff. I do encourage people to consider trying to fix their own stuff. And I do have my nonprofit, which has a number of different guides on how to fix your own stuff, whether it's an iPhone that's randomly kernel panic because the mic cable got sliced due to a poor design or just because you spilled something on it. I do try to share my business experiences. I try to share a lot of my business failures with you, of which there have been many in the hopes that you don't make the same failures as I do. But above all, I want to live in a more repairable world. Um, there's not really much you can say to stuff like that. This is kind of like the throw everything at the wall and see what sticks approach. There's about 600 videos teaching you how to fix your own motherboards in the hopes that you're able to do it yourself or start your own successful business. But I guess that is being a self-help huckster. Actually, I'm pretty sure he makes money on ranting conspiracies on YouTube. The repair business is just a beard. You take a look on Google. If you search by newest and you scroll all the way down, you will note that some of these reviews here, if you just keep scrolling, go back to 2009. 
three years before I actually had a, a YouTube channel of any kind. And when it comes to conspiracy, one of the things that kind of makes me sad is in the video that they're referring to, the horrible design of Apple soldered and SSDs, it's worse than you thought. I would really challenge you to bring up what is false in that video. If, the, if it is conspiratorial thinking, if I am saying that the, you know, the sun revolves around the earth, if I'm saying that aliens exist or anything like this, can, can you... Can you cite the time in the video where I said something that's incorrect? I said that the NAND is soldered to the board. Check. They use a non-standard NAND that is not available anywhere else. Check. That when this dies, your computer is a brick. Check. That part of the reason your computer is a brick and you cannot boot off of an external drive like you would with any other computer is because the SPI ROM, otherwise known as the BIOS, is now on the NAND. Check. Which is a where part. Check. And then if you go to Apple, they will tell you that you have to replace the entire board and they will not cover it under a warranty, even though this is a clear design defect that does not affect the A1706 and A1707, which have far fewer failures. Check. If this is a conspiracy, if everything I'm saying is conspiracy and not based in fact or reality, that means that I can fix this very easily using standard off-the-shelf chipsets that you're going to link me to, right? I can go to mouser.com and digikey and buy those NANDs new, right? Apple has an extended warranty program for H2141s that randomly blow up, right? Because um, this is a conspiracy and I'm lying. Something to think about. Informative, but yeah, a lot of the videos of the last few years turn into an Apple bash fest. I imagine that really helps drive views. Can't help if I want to make money, I would. I find I agree with them on a lot of the videos, and I miss the early ones of soldering boards and whatnot. This kind of reminds me of the always has been meme. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the always has been meme, but like the two astronauts in space and one is kind of pointing at the other with the, with the shotgun and is like, you know, you mean it's always been hot in Texas? Always has been. Uh, about three, I think I turned monetization on around 2016. So it's like 2016, maybe late 2016, I believe. You can correct me if I'm wrong, that I turned on monetization on YouTube. So about a good three years before I turned on monetization, I was discussing issues in the repair industry that mattered to me from a repair shop owner's perspective. When I released this video, this video made me no money because I did not have a monetized YouTube channel and didn't for years afterwards. Um, people found what I had to say interesting before I was trying to monetize it. I'm not quite sure what I can say there. This is something that I've been going over for a very, very, very long time. And Rossman, this guy literally makes money by creating controversy about Apple, and he aggressively manipulates his audience to achieve his PR goals. This expert lost all credibility in my eyes when he was bashing MacBooks for the USB interference problems that no other laptops have. While any computer repairman worth anything is perfectly aware that these issues are not only commonplace, but also caused by conflict and standards themselves. Not to mention, oh, okay, this is, this, this is a good one. This is a funny one, so get ready for this. What he's referring to is a video review that I did back in 2016. Uh, this is not a review channel, because in spite of many of the claims in this channel, this is solely a way to milk money from unsuspecting users. I don't do videos that actually perform well on YouTube if they bore me, and reviews kind of bore me. So somebody actually bought me a 2016 model MacBook Pro that required a dongle in order for you to have USB ports or Ethernet or HDMI, which was very controversial at the time, because at the time, Apple was selling the dongle for something like $70 or $80. And further, as I went over, if you scroll down into the comments, unfortunately, it's something you can't see anymore because this website doesn't exist. It was a pinned comment at the time. This dongle actually had universally horrible reviews on Apple's website. It was like one or two stars in the Apple Store at the time because so many people were having issues with it. But I didn't want to buy this $70 or $80 dongle. So I got a dongle that was about 30 bucks that was well rated. And when I plugged that dongle in and I tried to use it with my USB to HDMI capture device, it did not function properly. So I figured maybe I bought a bad dongle. I can't blame the MacBook for this. So I decided to borrow my employee's Dell XPS 9530 laptop. And I plugged in the $30 dongle that wasn't working on the MacBook into the Dell XPS 9530 and it worked. Now, people started getting mad, saying this has nothing to do with Apple, that has to do with the USB-C specification, that has to do with Intel, that has to do with everything else. But this would beg two questions. The first is, A, why is it that the $30 dongle worked in the Dell XPS but not in the MacBook? Secondly, is on a pro-level computer, why not provide Ethernet, HDMI, or normal USB to people that you know are going to want these ports? You were selling iPhones back then with a USB-A port, and you sell a computer that has no USB-A port that requires an $80 dongle. Are you serious? At the end of the day, uh, when it comes to conspiracy, I'm not sure if he's saying that I'm wrong technically, which I don't believe I was. The Dell worked with the dongle that cost $30, the Apple didn't. Or if he means that I'm actually deep faking this live stream, that this live stream was not real, that I like, maybe he's accusing me of modifying the machine ahead of time. And if that's the case, I just, I don't know what to say at that point. Uh, there's a very clear-cut security reason for it, but for whatever reason, nobody really wants to talk about how much machines are targeted by governments all over the world. Apple configurator requirements, from my perspective, is one of Apple's answers to intelligence agencies intercepting shipments to install hardware exploits. Honestly, it would be cool to discuss this, and to be clear, I have no problem with a T2 chip acting as a hardware-secure enclave to encrypt the data on the SSD. 
Now, having the T2 chip available for encryption if you want it is not my issue. The issue is non-standard NAND. Non-standard NAND that you cannot buy anywhere else regularly blows up. When it blows up, your option is to go to the Apple Store. And when you go to the Apple Store, they tell you to essentially buy a new board when it's their design defect. So design defect, it's soldered onto the board, so the board becomes useless once it has this defect. And essentially, you can't even boot into an external when you have this issue. Like, you put the SPI ROM on the NAND. These are intentional design decisions. And again, if we're making this so that, you know, Jack Bauer's laptop can't be stolen by the Russians or the Chinese in season five or six of 24, or season five or eight of 24, 99.9% of regular users really would rather, I, I imagine, would rather have a machine that still works when their SSD dies or is fixable than have a device that, you know, again, it's more difficult for Jack Bauer to give up information on when he's being tortured. Uh, this isn't for saving money in manufacturing. It's so you have to pay 1K for your device or a few thousand for a new device. Again, there's likely a genuine design goal that Apple had here. I'm not going to say that they don't. And I don't think that there's an Apple engineer that's sitting there thinking to themselves, how can this be more expensive? Rather, I think that the end user independent repairer is not a concern at all. The question is whether this has a practical difference on the real world outcome, for which the answer is no. Regardless of whether a repair is just a low priority or whether they're actively conspiring and smoking cigars and laughing, I'll be honest with you, at the end of the day, that's irrelevant to me. What matters is the outcome. I'm not thinking or judging them based on their intentions. I'm looking at their outcome. I look at their response to the outcome, and then I walk backwards and I work backwards from there. So if the outcome is an unrepairable product that you don't take accountability or responsibility for when it fails, that you don't make parts available for, and you don't care, I work backwards from there. Again, is it because you just don't care about repair? Is it because you're actively sabotaging repair? I don't know. And at the end of the day, I don't care. What I care about is the outcome for the consumer and the outcome for independent repair. You're right. I've never had an SSD fail on me or any Mac or PC I've ever owned. Not one. That's over 20 years of use, by the way. I think their finite lifespan is way longer than my finite lifespan. I can't invalidate people's experiences and I'm not going to try to. And there are a lot of people who would have not had a problem. If you haven't had a problem, I can't blame you for not prioritizing a modular or easily fixable SSD as an issue. That's fine. I think people should buy what suits their preferences and not buying based on the potential of a dead SSD when you've never had one makes sense to me. And you guys watching this have to understand that the average Apple user that's never had an SSD failure is not going to care about this and why. This is where most consumers are and this is where we should be meeting them. We have to meet consumers with understanding. You have to meet people where they are. And again, as I mentioned in a video about Amazon in the comment section on a particular video I did, if, you, if you'd if you say, you're an idiot, you bought an Apple, you're an idiot, why would you buy it with a Saturn SSD, you're dumb. You're just going to create a bunch of people that hate you. Since they hate you, they're going to do the opposite of what you say. They're going to continue to buy products with soldered in non-standard SSDs, which is going to send a message to Dell and Acer and everybody else that all of their product lines should have non-standard soldered on SSDs. So by being mean to people when they're telling you the honesty of their experience, you're actually going to create the very world that you hate and you're going to make it come here faster. I strongly suggest anybody who is tempted to respond to comments like that negatively would be open to watching this video that I will link down below. Neat. What SSD were you using 20 years ago? I've never had a car die on me in 30 years of owning cars. Not one. And because I don't know anything about cars beyond my own anecdotal experience, I'd rather spend five minutes of pining about my experience than five seconds to look into the life cycle of vehicles, I think their finite lifespan is infinite. And anyone who says otherwise, from car mechanics to the manufacturer's own service techs, must be a lying conspiracy theorist. The absolute level of discussion in this thread. I understand what he's saying as well. The I've never had a problem, therefore it's not an issue thing is a tunnel vision, and a lot of people fall into this in all areas of life, not just technology or consumer electronics. Almost no one cares about this issue unless they have a clickbait YouTube channel to supplement their dwindling Apple repair service revenue. Ouch. Ouch. You hurt me right here. Right here. Actually, a lot of customers do, and this is where I'm biased, and I'll admit it. For a long time, I was the only one speaking to walk-in customers at my company. And even today, if Steve or Kevin are busy, I will answer emails and I will also speak to customers on the phone. And it really kind of sucks explaining to customers that one, they have a machine that would be totally fixable if it was any other brand. But not only is the drive soldered on, it uses non-standard components we can't buy without cannibalizing a retail product, so it's not fixable. And B, that this is a flaw that occurs with these two models specifically more so than the rest of their product line. We have seen zero shorted SSDs ever in A1706 and A1707s but two to three a day for the H2141. And Apple will not fix it as a discount for being defective. This happens every day. This regulator fails every day, and the manufacturer won't cover the failure under warranty. That sucks. These phone calls cause a lot of customer frustration. 
And I'll be honest with you, that caused a lot of my own frustration because I'm explaining this over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Somebody's like, why would Apple do that to me? They've always been good to me in the past. Why wouldn't they cover it if they know it's a defect? Why would they make it so that it's impossible for you to fix? Having to have the same conversation like two or three times a day for three years, that sucks. And that's where a lot of my bias comes from. There are a lot of people that really genuinely do care about these issues because they're personally affected by it. And I am personally affected by it by somebody who advocates for and speaks to these customers every day. And a lot of what I advocate for here is not a change in the design. It's also a change in the service. And one of the things that I had uh, talked about in a video I did a really long time ago, the truth about Apple's engineering failures, is I went over how a lot of these design devices fail. And I really do believe this is another issue very similar to the 2011 and 2008 GPU failures that Apple didn't cover until there was a class action lawsuit. When people show up with a three-year-old machine that has a hole in the motherboard and an end with no liquid damage, no physical damage, a pristine exterior, and they don't cover it under some sort of replacement program, that, I, I really don't see a difference between this and the 2011 GPU failures that Apple didn't cover until a class action lawsuit in 2015. Another post. Error 53 is an interesting example. Touch ID. Apple has gone through tremendous lengths to preserve user privacy and security in their biometrics and elsewhere. Yet one obvious vulnerability is the sensor itself. Remember, Huawei is essentially banned from selling equipment in the U.S. because of concerns they would backdoor hardware. So this isn't purely hypothetical. Serializing the Touch ID sensor and implementing tamper detection is an obvious step to take. The pattern I see over and over here, and in so many other areas these days, is people who don't understand the technology assuming they know how things work, and when it doesn't go their way, they assume conspiracy rather than ignorance. Okay, error 53 is a big one, and this is one of those areas where I find it interesting that this person is saying, I don't understand the hardware, when it seems they don't actually understand the error. So the first thing to go over, when he says Rossman is very much included, and it's people like him who appear informed to the ignorant that just fuel this, error 53 was never about security. Apple has actually fixed it because error 53 wasn't a security feature. It was a bug. And you can find this on support.apple.com if you don't believe me. This is an interesting one and really has to be discussed in order to give insight into why we don't give Apple the benefit of the doubt. When error 53 came out, Apple Store technicians, as well as Apple PR, would tell the Guardian and people who walked into the Apple Store that this was a security feature. So if your home button was changed outside the Apple Store or an Apple authorized service provider, your phone couldn't be hacked. However, this made no sense for a number of different reasons. One. Touch ID buttons were not hot swappable. If you change the home button on your phone, it won't just work. Like it's not just gonna work and allow me to use the fingerprint sensor to log in. The fingerprint sensor is not hot swappable. It's, think of it like an IDE hard drive in comparison or contrast to a USB or SATA hard drive. SATA and USB are hot swappable, IDE is not. If you swap your home button on an iPhone 5S at the time, this is not hot swappable. The fingerprint sensor would not work. You have to reboot the phone for the fingerprint sensor to work. When you reboot the phone, the phone is going to ask you to enter your passcode. So hacking the phone via replacing the home button in this specific hypothetical threat model they proposed wasn't a thing because the phone was already designed in a secure way. You need to reboot the phone in order to log in with the fingerprint scanner. And when you reboot the phone, the phone is going to ask you for a password. What's more important is that error 53 would not show up until you performed an update on the device. So let's say I connected an evil hacked home button designed to steal your nudes. And let's say that I also attached a home button sensor to your phone that actually has the capability to hack you. Let's say that this worked, which nobody has proven and doesn't work. But let's say I attack something that has attached a home button that has the capability to hack you. How secure is it that this is only going to happen when you update the phone? Error 53 would only show up after the phone completed an update. So you're saying that this security feature that's for my security would only kick in when I update the device to a new version of iOS. So if I attached a hacked home button to my phone, that hacked home button would have access to my passwords, my passcode, my nudes for four months until I updated my phone? That doesn't sound very secure. That sounds actually insecure. You're going to brick my phone to protect me when I update the operating system, which could happen months after the initial exploit. If that's a security feature, I'm just going to be honest with you, that's the worst security feature I've ever seen in my life. The reality is that Error 53 is a bug. Error 53 was designed to brick a phone before it got to a customer and was never supposed to be on actual customer devices. So during the manufacturing process, if the Touch ID button in the motherboard hadn't been paired properly, it would brick itself with Error 53 and that phone would never make its way into a retail box or an Apple store. That's what Error 53 was for. It was never meant to brick phones in the wild. The problem is that PR ran their mouth off without talking to engineering to figure out what Error 53 actually did. And when the PR department did start talking to the Guardian, did start talking to the news, and Apple Store technicians did start talking to customers about the issue, they would claim that independence messed up your phone. You destroyed your phone. It's all on you. It's a security feature. The independence did something insecure to your phone, so there. Now it's bricked. 
People were actually going to Apple stores and hearing that the reason their phone was bricked was because some repair shop explicitly broke it rather than just saying that it's a bug. And I see this as a company culture issue. Like, this is about company culture. The company culture at Apple is such that the PR department doesn't speak to the engineering department to actually figure out why the phone wasn't working properly. They didn't want to talk to them to figure out why it wasn't working properly. And as a result of that, we never knew. If Apple's own PR department is unwilling to speak to their engineering department before running their mouth off to The Guardian, then how are we supposed to understand why and how they've done what they've done? This really comes down to how many liberties you grant your employees. And much of this is based on how accessible these departments are, how open they are to communicating, the company culture, etc., and so on and so forth. If your company culture is that unauthorized repair people are an annoying thorn in your side that suck at what they do, and this issue, Error 53, keeps coming up and people mess up their phone outside of warranty, it's not crazy to imagine that somebody at Apple defaulted to repair people f this up, even if the reality is that we had nothing to do with it. Conversely, when Apple's default is to blame independent repair people for their own bugs that were left in from the factory without even consulting their own engineering department, you can't be surprised when repair people become on edge and do not assume the best of Apple. If Apple is lying to customers and lying to The Guardian at the time that Error 53 came out about why it exists, when they have access to own their own internal documentation explaining it, how are we supposed to understand? how they design things when we don't have access to their own internal documentation and employees. At the end of the day, Error 53 was resolved through an update that fixed brick phones because Error 53 was never about security. And if this person who was claiming these things about me actually read up on Error 53, they would know that. Next. Yeah, I agree. People who don't understand why decisions are made and who are suspicious enough to not believe the answer when they're told why decisions are made are going to look back to when a teenager could lift the hood of their car and fix anything that's gone wrong and think the world has conspired against them in changing that. Some people hopefully are curious enough to consider less cynical interpretations. Most people aren't affected either way and don't much care. Personally, I think it would be amazing fun to have a real discussion on a number of these issues with Apple actual employees or engineers. What's the reason behind using X? What's the reason that Y couldn't be made available? I think many in this industry would give a kidney for the opportunity to have an honest and open dialogue. The reality is that these engineers are so closed off that Apple's own PR department will lie about Error 53 because they don't even get to talk to the engineers. So how do we? Many of us would love to understand why things are the way they are. We would love a dialogue. And the reason that the point we are at the point that we are is because there is no open dialogue. Soldered SSD is also more secure, which is a major reason Apple are doing it. It's much more difficult to drop a hardware implant into the device in line between the SSD and the hosting machine, or replace the drive with one containing malware if it's soldered to the board and encrypted with a key in the machine secure enclave. 99.9% .9 of customers will never be exposed to such an attack on their privacy slash security, but they do happen, and they have been happening since way before 2010. If you don't care about such things, you're free to buy something else. Technically, if we are talking about somebody opening up your device and putting an adapter between the drive and the motherboard and then stealing it back up before it gets back to you, technically, the lack of modularity makes it more difficult for somebody to open your computer and put something between the SSD and the motherboard. I would have to desolder underfilled NANDs, reball them, solder a jig in between them, and resolder the NANDs back on. And that might not actually even be a usable exploit because of the T2 chip. My rebuttal here would be that this is a very interesting threat factor to design the computer for at the expense of the other 99.9% .9 of the users that want the ability to replace their SSD rather than have a $2,000 brick when it dies. He's made his living repairing Apple products, but every other video is him complaining about Apple failings. He never acknowledges the things that they've done right. I also get tired of the repetition. I think he does this to pad out the length of his videos because of the algorithm or whatever. One of the things that's interesting is in that video on the SSDs, I actually brought up something that I thought that Apple did Good, and it's timestamped in the video. I think it's around uh, 648. Apple drives the industry forward with common sense innovation, and I appreciate that. There are several things that Apple does that I think are really good. I just so happen to criticize them here because I think something that they did was fairly bad. Uh, and one thing I find interesting because I've, it's kind of been like a, you know, a conspiracy theorist, self-help huckster, all this other stuff. Uh, in a thread calling me a conspiracy theory reactionist is all the conspiratorial thinking about me. The first four years of my channel were unmonetized, and the videos that I made back then were anywhere from 13 to 30 minutes long. Occam's Razor says the most simple explanation tends to be the correct one. Am I going out of my way to watch the timer to make the video as long as possible for an extra five bucks, or do I just not make short-form content because I'm just not interested in it? People want me to assume the best of a trillion-dollar company when that has been anti-repair at every single turn that think I artificially adjust the length of my videos to make an extra five bucks. You got that exactly backwards. Only a small percentage of users care about upgradability or running their computer for 10 plus years, where a repair becomes almost inevitable. Most right to repair arguments in computing domain call for a dictatorship of the minority, often making things worse for everyone just so that a small percentage of users can get their way. What about e-waste caused by modular components? 
That's additional material costs you have to pay in 100% of cases as opposed to faulty components you pay for just in a small percentage of cases. Does it really make sense to liken making calibration software available to living under a dictator? Like, really? Like, really? Living under a dictator, having calibration software. In the case of an A2141 MacBook, you are e-wasting the entire computer because the NAND died. How is that better than having a socket for the SSD? Or at the very least, making the NAND chips available so that when they die, a repair shop like ours can easily solder on replacements and allow the customer that you're not willing to service in an economically viable manner to leave with a repair when you don't. We're, we're trashing an entire computer because a wear part died, but somehow that's better for e-waste than having a socket for the SSD. The regulation should target reducing e-waste, component reuse rather than replacement, keeping price reasonable, and component level recycling. Modularity is a red herring that doesn't really solve anything while introducing points of failure. In my opinion, component level repair is the superior way to achieve this. Okay, modularity would allow somebody to unplug the old SSD and plug a new one in rather than having to replace a non-available NAND chip you can only get by harvesting them from another retail product. Component level repair allows me to charge several hundred dollars for something that a consumer would easily be able to do themselves, but that's hardly ideal for the customer, nor is it what I'm advocating for. Component level repair, above all, is what Apple advocates against us doing. I would rather that a customer be able to unplug their solids they drive and plug a new one in rather than pay me several hundred dollars to resolder one on. I make money when I solder. I would still rather, for the good of humanity and society, that the wear part, until we get to a point where that part lasts for 20 or 30 years easily, doink, doink, at the very least, make the chips available. He doesn't have a moral argument in any way. He has an opinion that he attempts to frame as a moral argument and attempt to give it undue weight. And he absolutely has the same money in the game. The estimates I see is that he's making hundreds of thousands of dollars from that YouTube channel. And before arguing absolute dollars, which is irrelevant anyway, consider whether Apple is more likely to go out of business because of socketing an SSD than Rossman would be if he lost his YouTube channel. That's a motivator for parasitic enterprises like this. The parasitic enterprise. I don't know. I show people how to fix stuff. <laughs> I show people how to fix stuff. I have a nonprofit that pays me zero dollars that creates repair guides on a repair site that tries to make repair more accessible to people who want to open their own repair shops or to people who want to be able to do their own repairs. But digging into that a little bit, digging into that a little bit, the moral argument. There are two moral arguments at play here that I think are really important to go over. The first moral argument to go over is that if the manufacturer has a design defect that is demonstrably true, I think that they should cover that for the customer. So for instance, in this video over here, Apple will never change. I'm going over the fact that the display cable is shorter on this year than on this year. The reason they changed the length of the display cable is because these are failing like crazy by rubbing against the machine. Apple covered it for the 2016 A1706, but they refused to for the 15 inch A1707, which has the exact same design defect and the same problem. My moral argument is simple. If you have made something with a design defect, you know it is a design defect. You have changed your design because it is a design defect that you should cover the users that paid you $3,000 for that device that purchased something that they did not know had a design defect. I think you should cover them. I think many people in this thread, if I offered a repair and that repair failed on day 368 and I offered a one-year warranty, I think many of the people in that thread would probably say Lewis's repair shop is a scam. Don't go to those scamming third parties that screw you over. And admittedly, rightfully so. If somebody was four days outside of warranty and I said, too bad, so sad, sucks to be you, I would expect many people in that thread, rightfully so, to say that I suck. I would ask them to hold Apple to that same standard that they would hold me. If you produce a device that you know has a failure mode and you're even willing to cover it on this model machine, but you're not willing to cover it on that, that that's immoral. I think that they should be accountable and responsible for the design flaws and defects the same way that they would hold me accountable and responsible for if I did a repair that didn't last and it was only a few days outside of warranty and the part that failed again was the part that I replaced. There are many instances where customers have called me and they've been two months or even four months or even six months out of warranty. Even if the repair was not the exact chip that I replaced, I just, say, I just tell Kevin, like, just, just replace it on the house. Just, just make him happy. Secondly, when it comes to the moral argument regarding right to repair, Yes, my argument is simple. If you bought it, you own it, and you should have access to what is necessary for you to be able to service your own personal property. It's about freedom. It's about not restricting people. Why is it that if a sleep sensor dies, that you cannot go to an independent and have them replace that sleep sensor? Why can't you get access to the calibration software or hardware to be able to do that if you purchase the computer? Why? Again, it's one thing to use non-standard parts. It's another to make everything unavailable so that you're not able to do it. My moral argument is simple. You bought it, you owned it, they should not go out of their way to keep you from fixing it. And to be clear, there is a difference between evolutions in technology and stuff that kind of gets done on purpose to make it more difficult. Going from an inverter board over to an LED driver 
is not anti-right to repair. Going out of your way to make sure that the chip is not available to anybody who wishes to do that repair and not making the calibration software to be able to do the repairs properly available is a moral argument. That is something that was done on purpose to make repair more difficult. Whether this is because of some board executive or somebody didn't do their homework or some reason because they're concerned about legal liability, at the end of the day is a decision that they chose to make. I don't care why they choose to make the decision. I just point out what the outcome is. On the money part, most of the comments on what money comes in from my YouTube channel are irrelevant based on the fact that I have had the same commentary on Apple for about three years before monetization was turned on. When it comes to motivation, if Apple became more repair friendly overnight, I would never be able to make a video on Apple's repairability issues again because they would not have any because they would be pro repair. If Apple actually fixed these customers' devices under warranty when they had issues, I would not have something to talk about. If Apple covered it, people who had Flexgate issues, I would not have something to talk about. My line of argumentation is very simple. My company got paid over $200 when Paul did this repair. My argument is simple. I should not be making money to do this. If my videos were listened to, if I got what I was asking for, I would have not gotten paid over $200 to do this miserable repair that you see here. Apple would have covered it under warranty for the customer and I would have made less money. Most of these arguments, in my opinion, make no sense when it comes to monetization, because if I actually got what I was asking for, not only would my repair shop make less money, but I would have less content for YouTube, because the content where I'm criticizing Apple for doing a bad thing would not exist. Maybe, just maybe, at the end of the day, I actually do want to live in a more repairable world, I actually do want to see consumers be treated better, and I care about the world kind of sucking less. Like, it, I know it's hard to imagine. I know it's hard to imagine. I know there's a lot of hatred towards this channel and towards me as an individual. I have an ugly face, I have an ugly couch, and I have an ugly voice. I understand. At the end of the day, it might just be that I want the world to suck a little bit less. Lastly, I saw many comments mentioning this, I'm just paraphrasing, that I only talk about Apple. That's the only, I, I ignore when any other company does something that's anti-right to repair. I run an Apple product repair shop. This may be a surprise to some people, but my repair shop is not a beard. It's not like there for the purpose of YouTube content. I, I actually have a business. Some people may say it's not a very well-run business. Some people may say that I'm not good at running a business and point taken. But it is a business, and it does, has had a reputation for over 14 years. I specialize in servicing Apple products. They make a small number of products, which makes it very easy in a very anti-repair world to be able to stock up on the schematics and all the specialized knowledge and information and tools that I need to be able to be able to offer to repairs with a turnaround period of one to two business days for most of my customers. So I talk about the products that I know. And I know Apple products very well. I can talk about how on an H2141, the TPS 62180 regulator does not fail in the other five areas it's using the machine, but it does fail very often on the NAS because I actually work on these machines. I feel confident in talking about what I know. So you hear about Apple more often because that's what I specialize in. When it comes to other companies, if Samsung tries to destroy the repair industry, you bet your ass they're getting mentioned on my channel. If wheelchair manufacturers go out of their way to try to keep people from being able to repair their products, you bet your ass that's getting mentioned on my channel the same way Samsung would, the same way John Deere would, or any other company. Why do I have more videos and Apple products on my channel than John Deere? Because I'm not a farmer. I grew up in Brooklyn. I live in a suburb. Brooklyn isn't known for its farmland. I talk about it when it becomes an issue. And I talk about when I notice it as an issue. Since I work on Apple products exclusively, I notice their issues more often. But you have to admit, when it comes to soldering on a component, particularly soldering on a component that is proprietary in nature and they're not making it available, while other manufacturers are starting to copy Apple, there is a case to be made that Apple tends to be the one that is doing it first. And one of the things that I've always mentioned on this channel and tried to make very clear is that it's not just Apple doing this. This video is titled The Myth and Fallacy That One Brand Is The Problem. And in this video, I'm trying to get across that it is not just Apple, that essentially Apple tends to be the first every other company follows along, and then you get this. Again, virtually everything that Samsung did that grew them a fan base in the early days, headphone jack, micro SD card slot, user removal battery, unlockable bootloader, is gone. I have no love for any of these other companies. I am not a fanboy of any of these other companies. And the moment any of them does something that is anti-freedom or anti-right to repair, and I notice it, I talk about it. Whether it's a tractor, a wheelchair, software, or a laptop. That's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. Let me know what you think. What do you think of soldered on SSDs in general? Do you think that they're a great thing? Do you think that when they are put together with a proprietary NAND, that that is a good thing or a bad thing? Do you think that when the SPI ROM is stored on the NAND instead of on a dedicated SPI ROM chip, that that's a good thing or a bad thing? Do you think it's a good thing that when the NAND fails in this computer, that I literally cannot turn it on and boot off of my backup anymore because the machine itself is a brick? Or do you think that it's all a conspiracy for my YouTube channel? Maybe it's all a conspiracy after all. And that's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. Andrew Tate of the tech industry signing off. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had a...
Some of this just makes me laugh. Some of this just makes me laugh. All right, I'll see you in the next video. Bye now. Lastly, uh, this is one application that we could actually really use help uh, with a user interface on. If anybody here is interested and has a good background in UI, UX, and is open to helping us put together a site for it. I've been talking about a lot of YouTube shortcomings recently, and admittedly, a lot the shortcomings with a lot of the social media streaming landscape. And one of the, there's a few problems with it. The first is that there's essentially one or two platforms, YouTube and Twitch, that are dominant. Nobody's ever going to use a different platform because when you go to a different platform, there's nobody there. The people that tend to be on the new platforms first tend to be kind of crazy. And you have to use a different application so you feel isolated. So we want to come up with something like what you had back in the early days of instant messengers. If you were using AOL, ICQ, MSN, Yahoo, you had four different apps. And then Trillion and Pigeon and GAIM came along and you had one application where you could use AOL, instant messenger, Yahoo, MSN, ICQ, and so on and so forth. And what we'd like to do here is we'd like to create a video app that works better than the stock YouTube app, better than the stock Twitch app, better than the stock Odyssey app, and so on and so forth, where you can choose the platforms you want to use. You can use YouTube by itself. You could use YouTube, Odyssey, SoundCloud, Rumble, PeerTube, Patreon, Subscribestar, Twitch, and Kick. You could use one, two, three, or you could use all of them at a time. You can use one at a time, or you could search all every platform all within one application. The application should give you a better experience than what you get from the stock application. It should be open source. And above all, it should have something called sovereign identity so that if somebody is banned from any one of those platforms, you can still see their content somewhere else without having to subscribe somewhere else. Right now, you subscribe to Lewis Rossman on YouTube. But why don't I own my identity? Why do you have to subscribe to Destiny on Twitch when Twitch can just delete his account after 13 years? You should be allowed to subscribe to a creator on the platform, but the creator should also have some sort of sovereign identity system. So you're subscribing to them in a gatekeeperless, authorityless way that doesn't allow anybody else to be able to delete their identity. So even if their account is deleted from a social media platform, you can still view their content seamlessly as if they had never been deleted on this other platform. We'd like to create a framework for that to be easy. And we want to create an application that doesn't suck. And we're like 99% done. I'm really happy with how this application's come along. I actually found the developers for this from a YouTube live stream. So I figured might as well fish for a UI UX person there as well. We're more than happy to pay you. Uh, this is a contract job. And if you do good with this, we may want to use you for the future. So if you think an application like this is cool, if you want to be a part of essentially selling this application to the world, VX, there's a lot of features in here. This is very... Uh, advanced power user-ish applications. We want to explain all the features in a website in a normal way, and we also want to make sure that the flow makes sense to a user in a way that maybe the engineers just missed while they were coding the application. So you think you'd be a good fit for this and you think this would be interesting, do let me know. My email is lewis at futo.org. That's L-O-U-I-S at futo.org, not puto.org. Don't you type puto. Futo.org down below. If you are interested, that's it for today. And as always, hope you learned something. See you on the next video. Bye now.